morning by turning to number 184. <clears throat> number 184 in the Purple Hymn Book. Let's sing all three verses. On our prayer list this morning, we've been asked to remember Christina Cheney, June Cromer, Ann Baker, Landon Stevens, Jacob Dargood, Dar Gavel, Liza Argenbright, Kim Hickey, Pat Rader, Wanda McFerrin, Ruby Cromer, <clears throat> Michelle Howard, Paul Wheat, Jerry Morgan, Glenna Smith, Marie Jennings, Ron Argenbright, Alice Stidham, Baby Lowe, Shirley Brown, Robert Heisel, Charles Bowman, Herman Pittman, Gunnar Garrison, Clifford Collins, Tamara Deck, and the family of Paul Nichols. So uh, let's remember those in our prayers today. Number 184. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, by me and mine 
reading this morning will come from the book of Jeremiah in your Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. As always, we're thankful for the presence of everyone, and I'm glad to be here with you this morning. My once a month term, sometimes it seems like it's been a long time since uh, I've been here when it's when the month goes by, and other times it goes by really, really fast. This was one of those months that went by really fast, but I'm glad, very glad to be here. And uh, if you're visiting here, well, we want you to know we're very glad to have you here with us. We invite your attention to the to the scriptures that you might study with us as we study and see whether or not the things you hear this morning are so and directly from the Word of God, because if it's not, it's of absolutely no value. And so we want we want to teach only the Word of God and speak where the scriptures speak and be silent where the scriptures are silent. Well, we just have one verse for our reading. This is a well-known verse to you that have been in the church for many, many years. Jeremiah 6 and verse 16, Thus says the Lord. And so this is God speaking here. Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not, we will not walk in it. Our lesson is entitled this morning, The Old Past, but before we study, we've got a great privilege to humble ourselves before heaven's throne. A brother has been selected, listen carefully to his prayer, and uh, let his prayer be your prayer. Let's pray. A wise and merciful Heavenly Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and holy name. So once again, Heavenly Father, we come to you in humble attitude of prayer. We're thanking you, Heavenly Father, for the many blessings you has given us from beginning down to this present time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sunshine, the rain, the seed time to harvest. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our jobs, our places to stay, our clothing. Heavenly Father, we know that you have blessed us in so many ways physically. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you most of all, though, that spiritual blessings thou hast blessed us with, that you saw fit to send your son Jesus down to this low land of sin and sorrow, that he may suffer and bleed and die on that cross, that we may have chance, Heavenly Father, of salvation. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time, thanking you for the church that is established at this place. We pray that we will always be that light set on a hill, Heavenly Father, that cannot be hid, and that people may come in and glorify you, our Father, which art in heaven. Heavenly Father, we know that oft times that we fail you in so many ways, that we are oft times weak, that we say and do things, Heavenly Father, we shouldn't do, and that we fail to do those things, Heavenly Father, that you would have us to do. We pray, Heavenly Father, that if you find repentance in our hearts, that you'll forgive us of those things and hold them against us no more. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we realize that we don't need to be committing the same sins over and over again, that we need to pray to you, be closer to you. Heavenly Father, walk closer in your way. Heavenly Father, we pray for those this morning that are sick, for all those that have interest in our prayers. Heavenly Father, the prayer list this morning was quite lengthy. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will be with these people, comfort them as only you can, and if it be in your will, to restore them back to their much-wanted and needed help. Heavenly Father, we also pray for those that mourn over freshly dug graves. We pray that you will bring them that comfort and peace that only you can give in this time of sorrow. Heavenly Father, we pray for those that rule over our land and country. We pray that they would always enact laws, Heavenly Father, that um, we may worship in spirit and in truth peacefully, Heavenly Father, while we are here on this earth. We pray, Heavenly Father, if there ever comes a time that they enact laws that are contrary to this, that we would be faithful to you, even if it means harm or molestation in any way. Heavenly Father, we pray for those in foreign countries that do not have the same privilege as we do, Heavenly Father. We pray that someday it may be granted unto them that they may openly worship you just as we have this privilege here. Heavenly Father, we pray for those preaching brethren to go from place to place proclaiming thy word. We pray, Heavenly Father, that they would always have whatever it is they stand in need of, that they may proclaim thy word to the lost and dying world. We pray, Heavenly Father, that through their travels that they would be safe and that we pray that whenever they return home that they would find things safe there also, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we pray for those that um, also that um, render care unto the sick. 
And we pray for those that respond to any emergency we may have, Heavenly Father. We pray that they would always have the things they stand in need of to perform their job and to if it be in your will to help people out that are out here in this world, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we pray for Brother Philip this morning as he stands before us. We pray that the things that he has studied would be the very best for this occasion. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you give him a ready remembrance of those things that he has studied. Heavenly Father, we pray for those that are lost out in sin. We don't pray, Heavenly Father, that you would save them in their prayers, but we pray that you would give them time and opportunity to hear thy word, be obedient to it, obey the gospel before it be everlastingly too late. We also pray, Heavenly Father, that for those that have once known thy way and have wandered back out into the world of sin, we pray that you would give them time and opportunity to hear your word once again, come back in repentance, Heavenly Father, before it's everlastingly too late for them also. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we go in the furtherance of this service that everything that we say and do would be pleasing to thee in accordance to thy will. And Heavenly Father, we pray that where we find the end of our way, that you would give us a peaceful moment in which to pass from this life. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we'd hear those sweet and welcome words, enter our end to the joys of the Lord, thou good and faithful servant. These prayers and blessings we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
our text this morning, I want you to put, have before you uh, ideas as we go along with this lesson that God has a better way. That uh, as we often, so often teach of when we look back to the Old Testament that man really hasn't changed all that much. There may be different ways to, to sin and to, to, to fail God, although there are a lot of similar ones. And, but but the, the thing is, for us, just like for them, there was, a, there was a path to follow. In fact, the idea here is singular when we talk about the old past, as I understand it. The idea from the, uh, uh, from the Hebrew language is, is a singular idea that we walk that better way, that, that, that path of God. And so he's, it, 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 the Lord says here, stand in, the, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths of where the, where the good way is and walk in it. This also refers, carries with it the idea of crossroads. We come to crossroads, don't we, every day in life? Before GPS, sometimes you would, you would come to a, you'd be traveling an unfamiliar area, perhaps you were working or on vacation, and you would come to a, a crossroads and you would have to stop and study it a little bit as to which way you were, were going to go. Well, the idea here is that we are to determine to walk upon the Lord's path uh, that, that this is the good way, this is the right way, this is the better way, the best way. And he says, and you will find rest for your soul. In other words, you will find peace for, uh, for your souls. And, uh, but the people said, uh, the Israelites here in, in, in Judah said, we will not walk in it. In other words, we're not doing that. Don't care what you say, we're not going to do it. We're not, we're, 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 this is not the way we're going to go. We want to go a different way. Now, folks, these were the people of God that had drifted away, drifted too far from the shore. Uh, read a little article recently from a fellow whose name was Daniel Amin, and he's a psychiatrist, a neurologist, and who has done 180,000 brain scans and written five best-selling books on brain health. I probably need to read one of those. And he says... The one, there's one question that will change your life. Now get this, one question, this man says, that will change your life. What do you want in life? That's a good question, isn't it? Now it's easy to overlook that or think that's a little too simple. But actually it's a very profound question. What do you want in life? And, and he says, ask yourself that question every day and then ask question number two. Does my behavior fit what I want? Now, that's a good, very good question, too. Does my behavior fit what I want? Does my life, my everyday life and the path I'm walking on, does it fit what I want? He's, you know, and he goes on to say that most people fail to do this. They don't have uh, that direction. The question is, do you want to go to heaven? That's what we're here about this morning. Do you want to go to heaven? Or are you just sitting there in a, a, a lost condition? You've never obeyed the gospel? Or perhaps you've obeyed the gospel and you've, you've fallen away? Or perhaps um, you're a member of the, the, the church and you come to church quite frequently, but you know you're not doing like you are to do, that you know that your example is very lacking that your Christian walk is not what it are to be. So the question is, do you want to go to heaven? Does your behavior reflect that? Do you want your loved ones to go to heaven? Do you, do you, you know, think, about your, think about your example uh, this morning. You know, you, uh, you, you, we've, we've got to be an example. If we would lead others to heaven, we all want our loved ones to go to heaven, don't we? But yet, we fail sometimes to be that example. Sometimes we fail uh, to be the leader in the home we should. Perhaps sometimes we fail to be the leader in the congregation uh, that, that we should. We've got to help each other. Husband and wives have to help each other. We can't be uh, like those people in the fifth chapter of the book of Acts uh, that, that uh, uh, the husband and wife both led each other to do wrong and lied to the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says they were, they were struck dead over that. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira, who, who I was trying to think of, there in the fifth chapter of the book of Acts. And so they were struck down dead because they lied to the church. They lied to the Holy Spirit. And they were struck down dead. That got people's attention. You know, leaders have got to lead, whether it's in the home or whether it's in the church. When, when, when the church calls upon you to lead, 
That, that it says that the congregation, as far as they know, that you are faithful in, your, in the path that you walk towards God. And that, you, and that as far as they know, you are the example of leadership that you are to be. And, and so that's important that you be that kind of person. And it is that kind of person whether you lead in the congregation or not. And, and in your Christian life, in your marriage, and in your home. And we need to remember that. We need to get our mind focused on that. Now, I'm going to give you kind of a little overview of, um, of chapters 5 and 6 here in the book of Jeremiah. And in the very first, uh, very first verse uh, of uh, chapter 5, Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 1, so we'll know from our text what's going, what's going on here again. The is Israelites are not doing like they should. He's addressing this to Judah. Now, uh, understand this. Judah was one of the most influential tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel. This was King David's tribe. And, other, and, and uh, Jesus was of the, of the tribe of Judah. They were leaders among God's people at this time in history. But the leaders weren't doing as they should. They were failing not only themselves, but they were failing their households. They were failing God, God's people. And verse 5 and verse 1 says, Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. Now remember, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He weeped. He was heartbroken for the children of Israel, for the tribe of Judah, because they wouldn't do like they should in, in the eyes of God. See now and know and seek in her open places. If you can find a man, is there anyone who executes judgment, uh, who seeks truth? Notice this, who seeks truth, I will pardon her. Now, I've got with me this morning a Jewish Bible. And I, I like to look at this in the Old Testament. And, 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 and quite often, the, the, the interesting thing to me about this is it's got a little more force uh, behind it. They're not, as, uh, they're not quite as nice in, in, in translate this. They're a little more direct. It says, roam the streets of Jerusalem, look around and observe and ask in open spaces if you can find anyone, and it says here in parentheses, if there is anyone who acts with justice, who seeks truth, I will partner. You remember before uh, God destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he, he would tell uh, Abraham, said, if you can find this many righteous people, or that many righteous people, or any righteous people, I'll spare that city. But there wasn't any saved lot, and, and his family and his wife didn't make it either. You remember she looked back after being told not to, and, and was turned into a pillar of salt. So the hearts of the people are being adjusted because they refused to do the will of God. But secondly, knowing that they were wrong, they refused to repent. There's a big lesson for us in that. Refusing to repent and to make what's right. And the reason for the sin in the Israelite nation, or the, uh, the reason for this problem was they, had, they wanted to continue on the path of sin uh, in their nation. Jeremiah's call to repentance was ineffective. Now this great prophet of God's call to repentance was ineffective because the people refused to take corrections. They refused to be corrected from the word of God. And they refused to repent. And one Jewish scholar wrote, let the mouth of the heretics be stopped when God warns a man once, twice, and even a third time, and still he does not repent. Then does God close his heart uh, uh, close his heart against repentance so that he should exact vengeance from, from him and for his sins. And verse 3 from this Jewish Bible, Adonai, that's the that's Hebrew name for God, one of them, your eyes look for truth. You struck them, but they weren't affected. You nearly destroyed them, but they refused correction. They made their faces harder than rock, refusing to repent. They're, they're, they, they stealed their face. And, and, and it goes on to talk about uh, here in, in chapter uh, 6 of verse 5, uh, that, uh, that they simply refuse to, uh, to repent. In, the, in, in verse 6 of chapter 5, let me read this. There, therefore, a lion from the forest shall slay them. A wolf of the desert shall destroy them. A leopard will watch over their cities. Everyone who goes out from there will be torn in pieces. Now, there's an aggressor coming. Here's the problem. They have refused to repent. They're in the holy city of Jerusalem. God, they're in a walled city, but God's not going to save them this time. In fact, God is sending a, 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 a heathen army from another nation to overtake them and to destroy them and take them captive. 
This is the result of ignoring uh, the will of God. It concludes by saying, because their transgressions are many, in other words, their sins are many, their backslidings have increased. Now, that's, a, that's pretty interesting to me. And, and so he's, he, he asked the question in verse, uh, uh, verse 7, you know, how shall I pardon you this? A Jewish Bible says, God said, how, sh how shall I forgive? Why, how can I forgive you? And he goes on, looking at it in verse 7, your children have forsaken me and sworn by those who are not gods. They've sworn by idolatrous gods. When I had fed them full, they had committed adultery and assembled themselves by the, by the troops in harlots' houses. They went to the houses of harlots in large numbers, in other words. They were well fed like lusty stallions. Everyone need after his neighbor's wife. They were adulterers. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? And shall I not avenge myself on such as this nation? And I think about this, and I think uh, that's how much we are like the, uh, like the, uh, the, the children of Israel. And uh, where America, our society, puts so, so much emphasis on, on lust. You stand and look at the, at the magazines there, the tabloids and all of that at the checkout counter at Walmart, and it's, they're selling lust. That's what they want. Uh, television, commercials, and on and on it goes. They're selling lust. It is a terrible thing. And what happens here then, God is going to bring his wrath down upon Israel uh, 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 because of the sin of rebellion. That says, we know, Jeremiah, what we're supposed to do, but we will not do it. We're not going to walk down that path. We don't want to. Here we are, the tribe that is supposed to be the rulers of the 12 tribes, the example of God. And they're saying, as a group of people, we're not going to do this. Jeremiah was preaching to a, to a foolish and senseless people. And God was going to, as a result of this, an unrepentant people was, going to, was telling them, that you're going to wind up as servants or slaves, in other words, to people of another land, of another country. And, and because I'm going to see that it, that it happens. These people still were totally insensitive to the handiwork of God. They had no reverence for God who controls the movements of the sea or who gives the rain in his season. While the, the, mighty, the mighty oceans obey the will of God, don't they? Israel would not do it. These people had a stubborn and rebellious heart. There's a great lesson for us to learn from this. They had departed from the boundaries established by the law of Moses. We understand boundaries, don't we? We understand you have, we, we have a property surveyed. We are giving boundaries in basketball games or sports, I should say. A basketball court has, a, you know, has boundaries around it. You step out, you're out of bounds. They take the basketball away from you, give it to the other team. So it goes on the football field, the tennis court, and all of these things we understand. We're giving rules in society, laws in society that give us boundaries. Boundaries actually keep us safe. But more importantly, this great book, the Bible, gives us the boundaries that we really need, that we really need to be concerned about. This is God's owner's manual. It is, it is a life instructions that we need. You know, you get an owner's manual with a lot of things you buy, namely an automobile, and you can ignore everything in there if you want to. You probably won't get to drive that vehicle for very long, or you're going to have some very costly repairs. But, but, but in life, we need to focus on God's owner's manual and doing what God wants us to say. You know, these people were totally, totally dependent on God for their harvest uh, to bring the rain. But, and he had blessed them so many times, and yet they had no intention of reverencing God. There was a social injustice coming about as Judah's sins had caused the rains to be withheld from them. And by devious means, the, the wealthy were taking advantage uh, of the poor and, and the innocent by ill-gotten gain. That's what we, we see that uh, time and time again. But realize this, acts of injustice are offenses against God and God must avenge them and God will uh, uh, avenge them. And in fact, that's one of the great lessons that we, that we learn here. There were corrupt leaders. Listen, the, the priest, the, the, a, lot, a lot of the prophets, that's why God sent Jeremiah there. The, a lot of the prophets uh, were, uh, uh, were crooked. And, and the priest, the temple priest, went along with them and, and, and were at their beck and call. 
the, however, the people were just as guilty as their leaders because they encouraged a, a deliberate perversion of divine truth. Now, in the end, they must all, face, all of them must face God or have faced God by now. And we will face God also uh, just like them. We cannot have a deliberate diversion of the Word of God. We've been given a divine pattern, God's own your manual, this, this great book. And we cannot pervert God's owner's manual. We cannot, we cannot pervert the will of God. We've got to stay within the boundaries of the will of God. We've got to keep ourselves there. We've got to recognize the divine pattern and do the things found therein, the way this table is set. If you try to change the way this table is set, you have perverted the gospel of Jesus Christ. If the Bible tells us to do something or not to do something, that's said, ah, no, 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 we're not going to do that here. We're not going to do that here at Chestnut Ridge. Then you have perverted the gospel. God won't tolerate that. And so we've got to remember that. So there was going to be, a, you know, an advancement of, of, uh, of the enemy. Uh, and uh, this, this was going to happen. And this was going to be a, this was going to be a real problem. And, uh, and in fact, let's look at verse 19 here in chapter 5. And we read here, I'll back up to verse 18 here in chapter 5. Nevertheless, in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a complete end of you. Now he says, I'm not going to wipe away the entire tribe of Judah or the nation of Israel. But most of them were going, were going to get it. And it will be when you say, why does the Lord our God do all these things to us? Then you shall answer them, just as you have forsaken me, the me being God, and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve aliens in a land that is not yours. In other words, he said, you're going to serve strangers in a land that's not yours. You're, the remnant of you is going to live, and you're going to be taken captive and, and, and carried away. You're going to do this because of your sins against me. You're going to be taken to a land far away from the land you, you, you grew up in that you were accustomed to, and you are going to, you're going to worship. Uh, you know, you're, going to, you're going to serve them, not worship, but you are going to serve them. You're going to be their servants. You're going to be your, your slaves. And so the idea is just as you've abandoned me. And here in verse, uh, verse 21, look at this. Hear, oh, hear, that, hear this now, oh foolish people. Without, uh, without understanding, who have eyes and see not, who have ears and hear not, do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence? He wants you to get this. But this is, this is interesting to me, though, how this Jewish Bible translates verse 21. Hear this, stupid, brainless people who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. You know what it is to be stupid, don't you? Listen, I came out this morning. It poured the rain at my house this morning. I came out, my truck window was down. Stupid! I was looking for, uh, lost my sunglasses on the, on the job, I said. Hope I didn't leave them under the house. I am not going back under that house. I was worn out. It was a Friday. I had a hard week. I, I, was, I don't care if there's the finest pair of sunglasses there was. I'm not going back under that house to get those sunglasses. I look in the floor. I was searching the papers. I'll see. I don't see them anymore. About the time I got home, I looked in the rearview mirror. My sunglasses were up here on top of my couch. Stupid! <laughs> we understand. Stupid, don't we? You don't mind Philip calling himself stupid. You don't like to be called stupid. Very seriously. When we're not doing what God wants us to do, we're being stupid. We are making a huge mistake. We're being brainless because we can't focus. That's what we, we've got to focus on the word of God. You remember what that brain professor said? He said, decide what you want. I had a preacher text me. There was, there was some fellows had this had this little podcast study going on, and they were spewing false doctrine. And th th these were members of the church, and they were spewing false doctrine. This preacher texted me, says, why don't people want to go to heaven? That's a good question, isn't it? Oh, we can ask everybody in this room if they want to go to heaven. Question is, what are you doing to get to go to heaven? Why won't you change your pattern of behavior that you could go to heaven? You've got to ask yourself what you want. 
You know, before you get turned around good, young people, you'll be old and worn out like me. And all I can think about is heaven. I won't stay here as long as I can. I won't aggravate over you if nothing else. Somebody said, you got several preachers to preach here this morning. I said, oh, I like that better than anything. I like that better than anything. But we've got to quit doing stupid. We've got to let go of stupid. You obeyed the gospel to be forgiven of your sins. <coughs> and then you walk away. You walk away from heaven. You walk away from salvation. Oh, you might come. Mostly regularly. But you're not putting no effort into this at all. You're brainless. As a, the Old Testament talks about, you're brainless. We've got to focus. There was going to be an advance of the enemy upon the city of Jerusalem. And the Lord, believe you me, they had problems. There was going to be a siege uh, there. And God says, we read a moment ago, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to wipe the nation completely out. I'm going to leave a remnant. That is a small quantity of something. A remnant, you know, something left over from the rest of it. So there was going to be a few left. You know, the church... The Lord's church in this country, it seems there's just a remnant left. And even if you break it down by congregations, there's often just a remnant left. We don't want the wrath of God coming upon us. And so that takes us over here to again to, a, to our text. And uh, the... Uh, and I'll back up here in Jeremiah chapter 6 to verse 14. And in verse 14 it says, They have also healed the hurt of my people, my, uh, my, uh, my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, where there is no peace, acting like everything's okay. Well, it's not all right. That's what I want you to think. Am I, ask yourself this morning, am I acting like everything's okay when I know good and well everything is not all right? Verse 15, were they ashamed when they committed this abomination? In other words, God said, when they sinned against me, were they ashamed? You ask them that, Jeremiah. You ask them, when they have sinned against me, when they have failed me, when they have committed abomination against me, were they ashamed? And the answer here is in verse 15, sadly, no. They were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. They were not ashamed at all. They have forgotten how to blush. There are a lot of things we are to be ashamed of. We're not ashamed of. Have we forgotten how to blush? Have we forgotten that? Have we forgotten who we serve and who we are to please? Have we forgotten that this great God that we serve and love, that he gave his only begotten son for us, that his son loves us, says he's our shepherd? Have we forgotten our shepherd? Are we staying with the sheep? Are we being the sheep, the, fa the faithful? We've got to remember that. And, and, and so we get up again to, to, to verse uh, 16. And, and, and again, the prophet is telling us, that you've got to stay on that old path. That is the prescription for your for your problem. And he said, you know, there's fixing to become, become a terrible invasion of, of Jerusalem, and and, and the, the uh, and it's going to be awful. But you, but but you can prepare for that by getting yourself on the old path. Only the old, those of the, that walk the old path. In other words, the idea was faithful to God will find rest for their soul. And the problem was that, that Judah uh, adamantly refused to walk those paths. God had set a watchman over them, the Bible tells us. That watchman was the faithful prophets that came among them, like uh, 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 Jeremiah. that says, you know, you've got to prepare for this coming invasion. You've got to prepare your soul. He, he didn't say anything about get your weapons of war and get ready. He said, you've got to prepare your soul. You've got to get ready. The devil's here. We gotta get. We gotta prepare our soul. Life is passing by quickly. We gotta prepare our soul to meet the Lord. This is what we want to do. 
He, God set this watchman over them, and they stubbornly refused to heed the warning. That's what we don't want to do. We don't want to stubbornly refuse to heed the warning. You know, in view of the, the inflexible and the stubborn and negligent behavior of God's people, God, and they were doing this as a whole in the city of, of Jerusalem, and, and in the land of Judah, they were doing this as a whole, not every single person. There was a remnant there, as we, we read earlier. But, but, but the vast majority was doing this, and God had no alternative but to unleash judgment. The nations of the world were called upon to hear uh, God's pronouncement against Judah. I am bringing disaster upon this people, he said there. Let's look at uh, uh, verse 18. Therefore, hear you nations, and oh, O congregation, what is among them? Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on this people. The fruit of their thoughts, their thought lives, what they allowed to go on in their minds, because they have not heeded my words, nor my law, but rejected it. And get this now. These people were playing church, if you will. They were Jews in a temple, but, but that was a type of the church to come. They were playing church. He said, for what purpose to me, this is God talking at me, comes from frankincense from Sheba, the sweet cane from a foreign country. He said, that's not doing me any good. You're sitting now. They were allowed to do this in the temple at that time. But their worship was no good to God. It was of no value to God. You go get all this high dollar stuff and bring it in to worship me, but you won't change your life. You won't change your pattern of behavior. And he says, your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor are your sacrifices sweet to me. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before this people, and the fathers and the sons together shall fall on them. The neighbor and his friends shall perish. He goes on to tell them time and again what's going to happen here because of their failures. And, and, and he said, you know, and because all of that was true, he was going to lay a stumbling block before them that they could not possibly avoid. And that stumbling block in this case was an invasion in which many of them would perish. They would die. And he goes on to, to, to talk about the description uh, of their enemy. You know, Jeremiah described a, an unnamed enemy from the north in terrifying detail in, in chapters 5 and 6. And he pictured them coming from the remote parts of, parts of the earth. Uh, this ruthless army would be armed to the teeth. And the approaching cavalry, would, would, the Bible says, would sound like the, the roar of the ocean. I envision that to mean like at high tide. That it was a, the sound of their horses was going to be so loud as here they, came, here they come for the city of Jerusalem. The mighty invader would swoop down upon the defenseless daughters of Zion. Uh, in other words, the population of, of Jerusalem. And at the approach of the, of the invader, the population of Jerusalem would be thrown into a panic in, in, the, in, the, in dramatic first and second person. Jeremiah describes this panic. He likened it to, to uh, the experience of a woman being in the, the, the painful labors of birth. And no one would be able to, to go outside of the holy city. The enemy would control uh, the, the entire countryside around the holy city of Jerusalem. And in view of this sad fate, Jeremiah called on his countrymen to mourn over what was about, what was about to happen to them. This was, a, this was a very difficult thing that was to come upon them. And, you know, he, he goes on to talk about in verse 28, uh, they, they're all stubborn rebels. They are walking as slanderers. Now, this word translated slanderer from, from the Hebrew carries out the, the, the uh, thing. They were, they were gossips. They were tail bearers. They, they, they were offering defamation of character, and they was doing these things, uh, these things that were wrong. And so it was very important. Now, allow me to uh, uh, back up to verse uh, 6 here in, 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 uh, in chapter 6, because I want to back up and talk about this idea. Now, he's sounding the horn, uh, the trumpets, and the trumpets, as we know, are a ram's horn, a shofar, and they, they, were, they were to be sounded. And uh, from this Jewish Bible in verse 6 again, it says, Cut down her trees, raise a siege ramp against Jerusalem. Now what God has told this army that's coming after Jerusalem is, you cut the trees down, you build a big mound 
so that you can shoot down into the city of that walled city of Jerusalem. You build a big man. This is incredible to me. This is this is what military engineering. They're going to cut the trees down. They're going to heap dirt. I don't know how many of them is going to take to do this and build mounds up on the outside of Jerusalem so they can shoot down into the city and kill the Jews. This is a terrible thing. But that's what we were talking about. And he goes on uh, there in verse 7. It says, just as a cistern keeps its water fresh, so she keeps her wickedness fresh. Wickedness was what was causing the problem. Wickedness before God. This was a terrible thing. We, we, we jump up to verse 10. And again, I'm reading from this Jewish Bible. To whom shall I speak? Whom shall I warn? Who will listen to me? Their ears are dull. They can't pay attention for them, the words of Andonai, again, that's God, has become unattractive, an object of scorn. Can you say that? Does the word of God become unattractive to you that you really just don't care all that much about it? He says, this is why I'm full of, this is Jeremiah talking now, this is why I am full of Andonai's fury. I am weary of holding back, Jeremiah says. I'm weary of holding back the word of God from you people. I am weary of this. He drops down to verse 12, and the second part of it says, Yes, I will stretch out my hand against those who are living in the land, says Anadai, from the least to the greatest of them. All are greedy for gains. Uh, 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 prophets and priests alike, they all practice fraud. Uh, they dress the, the wounds of my people only superficially. And, and there is a perfect shalom. Shalom means peace where there is no shalom. They should be ashamed of their detestable deeds, but they're not ashamed at all. And they don't know how to blush, as we talked about a minute. We go back finally, and I want to close again with verse six. I, I, I want to mention verse thirty in chapter six before we before we close. Verse thirty in chapter six. It, it, uh, it says, "People will call them rejected silver, because the Lord has rejected them." The idea is, when you're creating silver. If it's got too much lead in it, this is a representation of sin. If it's got too much lead in it, then it is rejected as silver. It's not recognized. Its value is done. It's zero. And so it is when we've got too much sin in us. That's the idea. You know, this uh, uh, passage here, now I want to I close this up. In Jeremiah 6, and, uh, uh, verse 16, you know, both Christian, uh, of the Christian persuasion and the Jewish commentators, they often talk about this, this ancient path. And an ancient path, this ancient path, you know, the old path, but, you know, the, the Torah, the first five books of the Law of Moses, taught, the, taught man to observe the spiritual path of their patriarchs, the patriarchs of their family as well as those who experienced re redemption from slavery in, in Egypt when, when God freed the nation, a, a, a representative of sin, from the Pharaoh, and he crossed the Red Sea, he parted the Red Sea, and they safely crossed across it. They didn't have mud on them, the clothes wasn't wet, none of those, those things, and they made it. And the ancient paths then are demonstrated by, by a life of faithfulness to God and his instructions. You cannot be faithful to God without being faithful to his instruction, to his will. Because these it, it gives us the boundaries that keeps us safe. The upright lives that God wants us to live. How we worship God. He tells us, you can't do it any way that, that, that you want to. Hey, you come over to my house and say, hey, we're going to do some work around your house. I say, hey, great. We're gonna we're gonna paint the whole thing chartreuse green. Trim it out in black. <laughs> well, well, now wait just a minute here. This is not sounding as good as it was. We're gonna throw that old recliner you like so well out. We're gonna put you a straight back chair in there, It'll be better for your posture. And in fact, boy, you need to exercise, so we're throwing the remote to your TV out. You gotta get up and turn the channels like you did in the old days won't be just a little bit till I'll be saying, you know, y'all for sounded good at the first, but why don't you all just go back where you came from? I don't want my house changed. It could always use a little work, but I don't want it changed. I like it the way it is. 
God likes his house. And my house, not even a, a, a one billionth of a fraction compared to the house of God and the will of God. He wants us to get this. He's saying, since the beginning of time, I have given you a path to walk on. And then we come to the New Testament covenant when Jesus dies on the cross. His church, he returns to heaven at the right hand side of his father that he, that he deserves and earns. And, 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 and Peter preaches the first gospel sermon and the church of Christ begins just over 2,000 years ago. And the ancient path under the new covenant continues. That's what he wants us to get. And there, there, is, there is no comparison to it. And listen, when you read through the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, every few passages will say things, and I see this in this Jewish Bible particularly, they say, Ananias, Ananias says this, therefore thus says Ananias this. Here's what Ananias says, because it's all about what God says, what God wants, who's in charge, who's running the show. Who's pointing you to the path of heaven? And, and who's gonna, who wants your life to be better and to be different than it is? That's the idea, that we've got to listen. We've got to listen. We can't be like these people and not listen. We can't say we'll not, we will not walk their end yet. A lot of our lives say the same thing. Our, a, a, lot of, a lot of our lives say we're not going to do it. We're just not going to do it. Don't care what Brother Obi says. Don't care what Brother Dale says. Don't care what Brother Philip says. Don't care whatever gospel preacher we come in here and say. We're not going to do it. We might do a little of it. We might stick our big toe in the water. But we'll be like some, some little, old, little old boy. Mama set him, in the, set him in the corner, set him in his chair, made a line there and said, don't you so much as stick your foot across that line. He works his toes over across there. He goes to get the switch. He said it was just my toes, not the foot. She said the toes are connected to the foot. You, you're going to get it. Why do we want to push the boundaries? Why do we want to neglect the true and the living God? Why don't we want to go to heaven? You're here this morning. You've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that we're to hear the word of God, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, to, to repent of our sins, that means we're tired of a life of sin and self, serving the devil and serving ourselves. We're ready to turn from that, turn our eyes upon heaven. And it tells us to make the confession that Jesus is just exactly who he said he was, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then we're told to be baptized for the remission of our sins. Acts 2 and 38, 1 Peter 3 and 21, just a couple of many places that teaches the necessity of baptism, to complete the process, to become a Christian, to have your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. But you've done this, and you've strode straight away, no matter what the situation is. You know the great thing is, as long as you're of sound mind, as long as you've got the health, ever how long that lasts, you can always come home. That's a wonderful thing. You can return to the shepherd bishop of your soul. You could return to the Lamb of God and let him be your shepherd our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You repent of your sins, and God will apply the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ to your soul, and you can begin again. And you can stop being like the people in the time of Jeremiah, and you can turn your eyes upon Jesus. If you're subject to the gospel this morning, please don't hesitate. Please won't you come while we stand and sing the song of invitation.
seated. The sign out by the road this morning, I may not quote this verbatim, but it says something to the effect that eternity is a long time to think about what you should have done. I'd like for you to think about that this morning and take that, take that with you because that's exactly right. Eternity is a long time. That's forever. Think about what you should have done, what you could have done. If you lose your soul over and over again in hell, you will re replay the times you had to do things different. If you want to talk about the lesson or anything else in regards to the scripture after the service, please feel free to let me know. If you don't feel comfortable talking to me, talk to Brother Dale, talk to Brother Obi, talk to somebody, please. I'll turn the service over to one of the brothers. And again, it's my privilege to be here at Chestnut Ridge once again. And God bless the faithful in Christ Jesus.
by him in store, let us do so at this time. in your books and be ready to sing in just a few moments. Uh, as always, it's been uh, wonderful to be here. Hopefully each and every one has enjoyed uh, the service this morning. And as always, if you have any questions about uh, anything that's taught here or uh, any way that uh, we worship, you know, always feel free to ask and hopefully we will be able to uh, help you understand and uh, if, uh, if we can't prove those things that we do here in worship or what we teach, then, uh, you know, we need to uh, uh, be taught the right way. And so uh, because we want to do what's right and we want to walk in the ways of the Lord and uh, not uh, uh, be uh, rejecting those things uh, that God teaches, like the little boy that came in to, to the dinner table and, and uh, he was standing up eating. He wanted to do something else. He wasn't happy having to come in and eat. And uh, he was standing there eating. And his father said, sit down, Sam. And uh, Sam finally, he sat down. He said, uh, I'm sitting down on the outside. But on the inside, I'm still standing up. And, uh, you know, that's, a, that's the way that uh, a lot of Christians are today. Uh, they're going through the motions. And... Uh, Sometimes they're not really putting their heart into it, and because of it, they're not really pleasing in the eyes of God. And uh, that's the way that the people of uh, Judah became. Uh, they went through the motions for a while, then they got to the point where that they, they completely resisted doing what God said. And uh, that's what happens over a period of time when we allow the world to enter into our life and become more important than worshiping God and reading and studying his, his word, praying. Uh, you know, those things happen over a period of time, and uh, this is what happened to the people of God, or at least most of the people of God. As Philip pointed out, there was a remnant or a small number that were saved uh, during this massacre. But, uh, you know, that's uh, we, we don't want to get to that point in our lives. We want to make sure that we continue to love the Word of God and allow it to dwell in our heart so that uh, it will continue to grow and abound so that we'll be the kind of people that God is pleased with and hopefully uh, each and every one realizes how important that is. But uh, uh, we're very thankful for the brother from Cincinnati that's here this morning with us and uh, Brother Keith Cromer, who's not been able to be with us for a while, we're happy to have him back, and others that might be visiting with us. We're so happy that uh, you were able to be with us here this morning. We hope you come back anytime you're in this area and uh, worship with us. I thank Brother Hayden to be speaking Wednesday night for us, so come back and uh, encourage him, and uh, I know that he will appreciate that. Uh, 
seeing your uh, smiling face back in the audience, I tell you, it's a lot better looking at a person than it is looking at an empty cube. It, uh, and I don't care how you look, even if you look like me, you know, it's better. So uh, come back and uh, be with us, and uh, I know that, or even if you look like Philip. So uh, come back and be with us. He was pretty easy on me, so I'm not going to say much. Very thankful for his, the words that he chose this morning, and uh, they were just right for the occasion today. And uh, so, uh, also remember the flower fund, and also the young people's fund. I know that uh, uh, they'll appreciate it in August when they all get together to uh, uh, worship and praise the Lord. Uh, I know that they'll appreciate it. So, uh, let's remember that. Remember to pray for one another. Remember to do all that we can for the cause of Christ. And as, as always, if there are those you want me to visit, uh, let me know. I'll be happy to do that, study, whatever it is that you want uh, done. You know, uh, that's, uh, what I, that's what I want to do. So uh, if there's any that would like to do that, just let me know, and I'd be happy to do whatever it is that, uh, that you need. So uh, uh, let's uh, remember to... Uh, Pray for the sick. Uh, the many is still in hospital, nursing homes. So uh, let's continue to remember them and to uh, do all that we can for the cause of Christ. So uh, there is uh, no other words or announcements by any of the brethren. We'll stand and uh, sing number 584, first and last verse. Then I have a, a, just a few announcements of people that's getting older. But uh, number 584. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from 